We've been hearing a lot in recent days about the decline of America. Nations are made up of institutions and it would seem that all the institutions in our country are in decline. In fact, I believe there are those who just want to tear it all down so they can build it back up the way they think will be some sort of utopian place. And although this has taken, I believe, a rapid acceleration because of COVID and the results of the recent elections, but we really shouldn't be surprised at all when nations decline. You see, all nations, including America, have built into them the seeds of decline. Nations go the way of all flesh under the effects of the curse, and they will all eventually suffer collapse and ruin. Now, I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom here tonight, but any nation that is established on the wisdom and power of men will eventually undergo that same kind of deterioration that mankind has endured since the fall. And listen, I understand that our country was established for the most part on Christian principles, and our founding fathers were deeply committed to the scripture, and for the most part, honoring God and following his word. But we have grown away from that. We are no longer a nation built on those principles. And it pains me to say it, but our nation has turned its back on God and very well may be on the edge of destruction. In fact, it's always insightful, I believe, to compare the theories of men with the revealed truth of God. For example, evolutionary globalist theorists of today believe that humanity is becoming greater and greater and that we are on the verge of a new world order and that it will be a time of majesty and splendor. But listen, folks, God's word paints a very different picture. Man is not ascending, he is descending. And history demonstrates a series of powers that rise and reach a peak and then fade and die as another empire takes its place. Some empires are stronger than others and they last longer, but all of them have within their fabric the seeds of their own destruction. They all rise and they all fall. In fact, you could really say that the world is a vast stage with the curtain still down. And the actors are behind the curtain preparing for the final scene in the drama of world history. And I believe that very soon the curtain will rise and the actors will come onto the stage and the final scene will take place. And in that final scene, a great world dictator will become the main character until one greater than he, the Lord Jesus Christ, returns to earth and establishes his eternal kingdom. At that time, all the nations of the earth will be judged and all the earthly powers will fall and Christ will rule the world with the rod of his power. This is incredible to consider, but it is absolute truth. And we know that because it is revealed to us in God's word. The book of Daniel takes us behind the curtain before it rises and gives us a sneak peek of what will take place in the future. Daniel 2, 31 to 49, describes what is known as the times of the Gentiles. 
It provides a synopsis of history under the power of the Gentile nations. Do you remember what Jesus said in Luke 21, 24? He said, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Don't miss this. Those times began with the Babylonian captivity in which Daniel and his three friends were taken. And that time is still going on today. It will not end until the second coming of Jesus Christ to this earth. And we are still living in that period of time here in the year 2021. These are still the times of the Gentiles. You say, but what about Israel? I mean, it is once again a nation. Doesn't that mean that the days of the Gentiles have passed? No. At this point, Israel does not possess the fullness of its inheritance that was promised by the Abrahamic and Palestinian covenants in Genesis 15, 18 and Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 9 nor does it dwell in peace. Although under the Trump administration, there were some amazing attempts at peace deals. And we know that ultimately there will be a peace treaty that will usher in the Antichrist onto the world scene. But as of now, there are many nations who would love to see Israel wiped off the face of the earth and even in those days of tribulation, near the end, when the Antichrist leads his reign of terror, the nations of the world will come together to attack Jerusalem. The Bible makes that clear. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit. But the point is that the Gentile nations have trodden down Israel since the days of Nebuchadnezzar until the present. They have been trampled underfoot just as Jesus said they would be. And my friend, listen, that will continue to one degree or another until Jesus Christ returns to this earth and the times of the Gentiles is complete. Well, let's go to Daniel's interpretation of the king's dream and how it reveals the course of history for the times of the Gentiles. The dream begins in verse 31. We read it a few minutes ago, but let's walk through it. God reveals through this dream four kingdoms that will rise and fall before Jesus Christ returns to this earth to establish his eternal kingdom. Three of the kingdoms have already come and gone. The fourth one has also fallen, but not completely. We have not seen the complete fulfillment of the last kingdom. I believe the scripture indicates it will rise up again near the end of the times of the Gentiles. And it will be this last form of the fourth kingdom which will be smitten by the great stone in Daniel's dream. Now verse 31 tells us that the king's dream was that of a massive statue with a head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of partly iron and partly clay. And it's easy to see why this dream was so frightening to the king. The word for large there means immense or massive. This thing would have been like a giant skyscraper. And while we're used to seeing those, they were not. So this was an enormous statue. The word for of extraordinary splendor means that it shone brilliantly in the sun. Can't you just picture it, all this in your minds? 
It was something that you couldn't really look directly at because the sun would be glistening off of it and blinding you. The word for awesome means terrible or that which inspires great fear. No wonder the king would wake up sweating every night as he saw this thing in his dream. And as Nebuchadnezzar beheld this image in great wonder and amazement, suddenly a huge stone came from nowhere and crushed into the statue. And it struck the statue with such force that it crushed it to powder and the wind blew it away like chaff. What a scary dream. Now, notice the different elements that made up the statue. It is important to take notice of the fact that it was made up of elements with decreasing weight and decreasing worth from top to bottom. In terms of value, it started with the gold at the top. It deteriorated in value to silver and then to bronze and then to iron and eventually to iron mixed with clay. And by the way, the word for clay there really means baked clay. So it refers to brittle ceramic tile. It's easy to see that's the most fragile of all the substances. And note also that there's a corresponding lowering of specific gravity for each element. Gold is heavier than silver. Silver is heavier than bronze. And it, so it goes down the line. We also see in terms of position, there's a message of decline. The head commands more honor than the feet, for example. Symbolically, we can see the higher elements having greater glory. So what should we make of this picture of decline? Well, in contrast to those who think this world is getting better and better, I think the symbol here is the exact opposite. This world is in a state of decline, and that decline will continue until the great stone sets up his eternal kingdom. And if this is what is being pictured here, that is in direct con contrast to many theological schools of thought. It is in contrast to the views of the all-millennialists and those of the evolutionary theorists. It's in contrast to the dominion theologians of our day. It, it goes against those who would say that the goal of the church is to transform our world and to make it better and better and to bring in the kingdom. That's not how it's going to happen, folks. The world is going to get worse and worse until a cataclysmic event transforms it in an instant. And that cataclysmic event will be the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at these successive kingdoms and see God's perspective of it. We begin with Babylon. Listen, we don't have to do any guessing on this one because our text tells us exactly what the head of gold represents. There's no doubt about it. The head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar himself. Look at the end of verse 38. You are the head of gold. Can you make it any clearer than that? He's clearly speaking of Nebuchadnezzar here. He calls him the king of kings in verse 37. He tells him God has put him in power over all the earth. And I think it's important for us to understand that there has never ever in history been a kingdom quite like the kingdom of Babylon. This was the pinnacle, if you will. There would be, of course, other kingdoms, but they would be inferior to this one. And what we may not realize is that Nebuchadnezzar was the only world ruler 
to ever be the head of an absolute monarchy. He's the only one. Jeremiah said of God's appointment of Nebuchadnezzar, I have made the earth, the men and the beasts which are on the face of the earth by my great power and by my outstretched arm. And I will give it to the one who is pleasing in my sight. And now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servants. I mean, that's as absolute as you can say it. Now, it might be difficult for us to understand why God would choose a man like Nebuchadnezzar to wield this kind of power and authority. But in the sovereign wisdom of God, he chose this man to be the head of gold and to have supreme authority on earth. And there has never been another kingdom like his Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom spread over most of the civilized world of that day from Egypt and Israel to the Persian Gulf. The statement in Jeremiah about the beast of the field and the birds of the sky, that's simply hyperbole to show the extent of his reign. It's like saying his reign was absolute. It covered the whole earth. Although he only reigned for 43 years. His kingdom really lasted 70 years. And of course, that was the duration set by God for the chastening of Israel until they were allowed to go back to their homeland and rebuild Jerusalem. And it is significant to note that God raised up this king for the specific purpose of disciplining his people, but as soon as that purpose was complete, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was no more. Herodotus, an ancient historian, visited Babylon nearly 70 years after its destruction, and he reported that he had never seen such a proliferation proliferation of gold. In fact, he said that if you took all the gold that was in the temple idols and vessels, there would be more than 22 tons of it. No wonder Babylon was pictured as the head of gold. But let's move on to the next kingdom, Medo-Persia. Look at verse 39. And after you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you. We don't have to speculate about this second kingdom either. It is clearly the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. They were the ones who defeated the Babylonians. They were, in history, the second world empire. And note, according to verse 32, the second kingdom was represented by the statue's chest and arms of silver. This implies that this kingdom would have a solidarity to a certain degree, but not like that of the head. There was a twofold division coming together into one. This is exactly what we find when we study the history of the Medes and the Persians. They were two separate people, but they ruled the world together as one. And note the word inferior in verse 39. This term probably just means it was lower on the statue in height. It doesn't necessarily mean that it was less dominating in power or size. Of course, there is a sense in which it was weaker than that of Babylon because it was a divided kingdom. And as such, it was not an absolute monarchy as Babylon was. But as far as (coughs) physical size and strength, the three kingdoms after Babylon were progressively larger And each one was physically stronger than the previous one. So what should we conclude 
Well, perhaps we should conclude that God's picture of these kingdoms may refer more to the moral and spiritual quality of these kingdoms than to physical size and strength. And remember, this is a revelation from God, and everything is being given from his perspective. It's also interesting to note that verse 39 refers to the second kingdom, but it says nothing at all about it. Of all the kingdoms mentioned here, this is the only one about which no specifics are given. You say, why is that? Well, we can't say for sure because we're not told here, but perhaps this is to alleviate Nebuchadnezzar's concerns over what kind of empire would topple his own. And of course, history itself provides the details of this kingdom for us. It was established in 538 BC under the reign of Cyrus the Great. It lasted about 200 years until 330 BC. And in fact, silver did indeed characterize this kingdom as they were the first to use silver for currency and to impose a system of taxation which required that it be paid in silver. And while Babylon was known for its gold, Medo-Persia was known for its silver. And by the way, we must keep in mind that all these kingdoms were revealed by God before they ever existed except for Babylon. Daniel did not live to see any of these other kingdoms, but he already knew about them because God had revealed this through the king's dream. What's the next one? Greece. Go back to verse 39 again. Then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. And again, we don't have to speculate. History makes it clear for us. Beginning in 334 BC, under the military leadership of Alexander the Great, Greece conquered Medo-Persia and all the regions of the east as far as the borders of India. Verse 32 tells us that This kingdom is represented by the statue's belly and thighs of bronze. And so this kingdom appears to have some solidarity, but some division at the same time. Interestingly, history records that after Alexander died, the Greek empire was divided among four generals... But ultimately, it had a twofold division between the Seleucids in Syria and the Ptolemies in Egypt. And the dream that Daniel interpreted characterized the Greek kingdom as one of bronze, probably in reference to its army. W.A. Criswell explains it is easy to imagine what an astonishing impression the Greeks must have made on the civilized world. Consider the contrast between their soldiers and the soldiers of the Persian army. Had you seen a soldier of Media or of Persia in the days when they controlled the civilized world, he would have looked like this. On his head would have been a soft turban-like covering He would have been clothed with a tunic, with sleeves, and with trousers full and long. But when you saw a Greek soldier, he would have had a helmet of brass. He would have had on his body a breastplate of brass. And before him, he would carry a shield of brass and a sword of brass. Criswell concludes, this is why the classic writers of ancient days referred to the brazen-coated Greeks. This is what they were known for. There's absolutely no doubt that brass or bronze was the sign and symbol of the ancient Greeks. Verse 39 also says that 
this kingdom would rule over all the earth. Indeed, Alexander the Great conquered most of the known world of his day. And of course, the popular story is that he then wept because there were no more lands to conquer. And we know from history that he conquered Egypt, most of Europe, and all the land from Asia Minor to the borders of India. So no doubt about it, this was the third great world empire. Oh, but there's another one. Fourthly, we have Rome. Rome. Now this one is unique. The interpretation of the dream goes into much more detail at this point. Look at verse 40. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, and as much as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. <coughs> and in that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron, and as much as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of, of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another even as iron does not combine with pottery. Wow, the kingdom of the Medo-Persians is barely mentioned at all. But this kingdom is described in great detail. Why is that? It's because this kingdom provides the prophetic key for the future. And again, there's no question that the legs of iron represent the Roman Empire. In Daniel's day, iron was the strongest metal known to men. And the Roman Empire was the strongest of all the world empires as far as brute strength is concerned. The Roman Empire's war machine with its iron chariots and weapons slowly but completely rolled over the lands that had comprised the previous great world empires until it assimilated all the peoples and cultures into one government. And verse 40 pictures this war machine as that which crushes and shatters and breaks into pieces all its enemies. That's exactly what Rome did. And the Roman legion was known far and wide for its ability to crush all resistance with an iron hill. And the fact that this empire is pictured as two legs is easily seen in the fact that the Roman Empire was divided between the east and the west. And think about this. While the Babylonian Empire lasted about 70 years, and those of the Medes and Persians and Greeks lasted about 200 years each, the Roman Empire lasted more than 500 years in the West and even longer than that in the East. It's probable it lasted that long because it ruled with an iron fist. No empire has ever come close to equaling its strength or endurance. Ah, oh, but you say, what about the feet and toes? What is that all about? Well, it's interesting because the feet and toes are made up of an unthinkable combination of elements. You see the incredible strength of iron mixed in with the fragile aspect of common clay. Here's my belief about that. I believe this is pointing to a future kingdom that will be a revived Roman Empire. It will not be as strong as the original Roman Empire represented by the legs, but will have the seeds of its own destruction 
built into it. And I believe this will be the kingdom of the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 12 tells us that the beast will be mortally wounded but will miraculously rise from the dead. That may be a reference to the revival of this ancient empire. And it's interesting to read what commentator Robert Culver wrote a few years ago. He said two millennia ago, Rome gave the world the ecumenical unity that the League of Nations and the United Nations organizations have sought to revive in our time. He said they are revivals of the ancient Roman ideal that never since the time of Augustus Caesar has been totally lost. And of course, down through history, several attempts to revive the great Roman Empire have been made. It was tried by Charlemagne and by Napoleon and by Hitler and by Mussolini. But so far, it has not been accomplished. In our own day and time, it appears to be the agenda of the globalists. And it's really interesting how that agenda has ex uh, accelerated rapidly due to the recent pandemic. There are now rumblings of one world economies and one world control through technology. And we see those all the time. We see articles all the time about that kind of stuff. But it looks like it's actually really going to happen. In fact, we're seeing outright attempts to destroy current systems so there can be a, quote, global reset. This is exactly what we would expect to see if we're getting close to the time of the tribulation. And I think it's significant to consider the fact that the weakness of this final form of the Roman Empire will be its lack of solidarity. In other words, the Antichrist will try to mix what cannot be mixed. Trying to mix iron with clay is not a good idea, and yet that is what will happen. The original Roman Empire was strong in that its government was solidly organized, its armies were well-disciplined, and its policies well-defined, as evidenced by the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. But the future form of that kingdom will be characterized by weakness. What will be the weakness of that kingdom trying to mix iron and clay? That's going to be the weakness. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? Well, I can't be certain about this, but it seems to me this is implying a kingdom without any real unity. The unity is artificially built in, perhaps, by the use of force. And it's interesting when you think about it, but one of the first things the globalists want to accomplish is to eliminate all national loyalties. And that, by the way, has been the first goal of all world conquerors in history, beginning with Nebuchadnezzar and going all the way down to the Tsar of Russia. And it's interesting to see this has already occurred in Europe. People no longer want to be called Italians or Germans or Swedes. They want to be referred to as Europeans. And the Ryder Cup, they have the European flag. And I believe this is the reason why there was such a strong reaction to Donald Trump's America First agenda. It didn't fit in with what the globalists are trying to do. But of course, they're probably right back on track now. And eventually, they will usher in the reign of the Antichrist. But he may discover too late, this artificial unity is extremely weak. 
just as you can't mix iron with clay and come up with anything strong, so you can't force the unity of various nationalities and cultures without severe problems coming to the surface. Look again at verse 43. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another even as iron does not combine with pottery. The seed of men is a reference to human beings. And what he's saying is this, is this is not going to mix well. The diversity of the future form of the Roman Empire will be its destruction. It will be a confederacy, and its power will be distributed among too many people and too many different people. In fact, the Bible tells us that this kingdom will have a tenfold division represented by the ten toes of the statue. And we're going to see this referred to again in the seventh chapter of this book in the description of the ten kings. It is also significant to note that this same number is used to refer to this kingdom of Antichrist in Revelation 17.12. Revelation 17, 12 says, and the 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. They're going to get their authority from Antichrist. The future kingdom of the Antichrist will be ruled by 10 kings, but this will be its weakness. All but None of that's really going to matter anyway because the great stone will come and crush it to powder. Once the ten-toed confederacy takes its final form and Antichrist assumes his rule of the earth, it won't be too long until the crushing stone, the Lord Jesus Christ, will come with thousands and thousands of his saints to crush the rebellion of men and judge the nations of the earth and to establish an eternal kingdom that will never end. It will be established on the earth for a thousand years and after that it will go into eternity as the kingdom of God. And listen, whereas the kingdom of Antichrist could not pull off the unity of all the people of every tribe and nation and tongue and color and race, whereas the Antichrist won't be able to pull that off, the kingdom of God will. Then and only then will there be true unity around the throne of God. Oh, my friend, listen, don't hang your head in these troublesome times we're living in. The kingdom of the Lord is coming. How exciting it is to be living in a time when we can see all of this on the horizon, when we can see all of this taking shape. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we pray you would help us to recognize that you have a plan. Your plan is perfect. Your plan will be carried out. And Lord, we can take great comfort in that, of knowing that you are absolutely in control. And Lord, we thank you that you've already given us a glimpse of the future. We, we've already seen behind the curtain, even before it's come up, to reveal these characters of the last day but Lord, we know because your word tells us that we have nothing to fear. So Lord, we thank you for that. Help us to live in light of that truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.